really keen on a discussion around this. So this, uh, what I want to talk about is based on a piece that was co-authored by um, myself, Catherine Wright uh, at the University of Newcastle, Newcastle University, and Roberta Guerina at the University of Bristol. And uh, in terms of what motivated us to write this piece, I think, you know, it came from uh, really, you know, Facebook messenger chats and video chats. Um, and just us talking about our lived experience um, at the start of um, COVID, but also in the context of other conversations that we've been having for perhaps about five, six years now around crisis. So first, um, the financial crisis and the ensuing uh, austerity, and then Brexit and the work that we do on that, and more recently, COVID. But also, uh, it comes from our specific positionality. So myself, as a Black woman in Scotland, trying to navigate a relatively new institution, because I just started my job in, at Stirling in 2019. Uh, Catherine navigating the sort of promotion system. She just gotten promoted. And the impact of the crisis response on sort of a mobility within the institution and Roberta, who's a senior to us, a professor, the director of the center, but also moving to a new institution. And of the three of us, she had two children and was trying to commute and uh, ensure that, you know, their own education was going as it should be going. So, uh, but of course, we're also uh, collocated in different uh, parts of the country. So I'm in Scotland. Catherine is in the north of England. And um Roberta is down south, a, you know, on the border, kind of, uh, with Wales. So we thought, okay, we're having very different uh, experiences, but we're also having um, similar issues in that, you know, we're all in British universities, and although all our institutions were perhaps responding in different ways, so in Stirling, for example, they were quite decisive about when we moved um, a online, whereas I think it took a while for um, Bristol to make that decision, there were still some commonalities. One of the things that we noticed is sort of, you know, when COVID happened, um, crisis tends to provide an opportunity for change or uh, the status quo. And what we saw was kind of the status quo and change happening all at once, where you had a lot of emphasis on uh, researchers to kind of pursue money that would fund uh, COVID related research, regardless of what it is that you'd previously done. And of course, for our part, as people who are interested in crisis, we didn't necessarily think that that was contra to some of what we might be interested in. But of course, the ways in which we were particularly interested in COVID, which was not short term, which was sort of trying to understand the, its impact uh, on a sort of spectrum or a continuum was not necessarily, um, I would say, did not necessarily speak to the kind of um, urgent or reactive type of funding uh, that was being, um, that was really being pushed both by uh, universities, but also by funding bodies. So, you know, we kind of defied that idea of newness. And we thought that that was really fascinating. We were concerned that, you know, those who would be considered productive going forward are those who are doing the research on COVID because, you know, they're able to publish much faster. At the same time, we were expending so much energy around uh, teaching, making sure that our students are safe. And of course, all of this was happening um, at the same time where some of us were experiencing real traumas around the um, murder of George Floyd in the U.S. and, uh, you know, the black, the black profiles and black buttons uh, and and the institutional rhetorical support for Black Lives Matter and racial equality that was not really borne out in the everyday practices of these institutions. So we thought, okay, you know, another commonality is that we're all in sort of the same, we're in the same discipline. So we needed to reflect on that in the context of being in Paul IR, so to speak. So the one thing I would want to mention about this particular piece is that, um, as you know, it is published in uh, Gender Work and Organization, but was actually initially submitted to politics and gender. Uh, so for 
those people who are familiar, this is one of the top um, journals around gender and politics. And it had a call out for a 2000 word piece um, around COVID rapid, rapid uh, research. And we thought that this would be a good fit, but it was desk rejected um, because it wasn't deemed to be a fit. And um, perhaps in the, uh, in the Q and A, it's something to come back to. And we subsequently submitted um, unedited to um, gender work and organization and it was uh, accepted. Um, the other question that um, Amanda asked is, you know, why ontological insecurity as an operating uh, concept? And I've been thinking about this. It's probably the question that I thought about the most um, when, when I was preparing for this. Um, in the sense that, you know, on the one hand, I think, you know, frankly, it kind of describes how I constantly feel uh, ontologically insecure in the institution. Again, as somebody who resides in my body and is, it, um, is in my position. So it's not necessarily a new feeling. Um, and it's, it's one that has um, often resonated actually in the everyday um, and outside of actually security studies for me. I think that um, in our discussions, we realized that we have, um, this was the one thing that even though it's often quite difficult to articulate that sense of anxiety undermines uh, what the system, the university system, in particular in the UK, but more broadly really uh, in, in the discipline um, would suggest would make a good academic. Um, and you might notice that in the article, you know, we really focus on research and the impact on research. That wasn't because uh, we were not thinking about teaching. In fact, that was probably the only, the thing that we prioritized above everything else. But we also knew that, you know, because of how, at least for the three of us, our identities were wrapped up in sort of that dual place of being researchers and teachers and we were being sort of forced to dedicate all of this energy to um, uh, learning and scholarship without any reflection on how uh, it's actually the balance that has made us previously uh, good teachers um, and good researchers. So the ontological insecurity as an operating concept came from the fact that you know Jennifer Mixon and uh, others have really good definitions for how we were feeling. Um, it's linked to a precarity and sort of, uh, I also think that's fascinating. So I like to think of this particular article as like the first in a, in a trilogy. So there's uh, this piece and there's another one that um, we've uh, also co-authored and then there's another piece that I've written on my own where I sort of uh, tackled that um, idea of precarity and, and insecurity. I think they are related, but I, again, perhaps this is a, a bias of our, 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 our place of uh, what it is that we study. Um, so on to the next question about um, how the pandemic has really brought to light the role of care work and how we fund the role it plays in how we function as uh, communities and how um, we shape the economy. So I think I don't know if COVID has altered how higher education has um, how higher education understood care work. I think, I mean, there's been so much work done, especially in the United States around care and being in higher education that I'm not convinced that, you know, this is, uh, this is new or somehow that it has changed how we understand it. The only, th and, and, and also, you know, if you think of care work, not simply as taking care of children, but the sort of caring that is done within the academy itself, I would suggest that, you know, so we're seeing it in very sort of heightened uh, forms right now. And um, everyone has to at least consider it, even if they're not doing it. I think that's the main difference. Um, but does that actually impact on um, institutional changes? That I don't think that uh, we've necessarily seen. Uh, at least we've not seen a lot of, not in the context of UK universities. Uh, some institutions, like I know that um, Strathclyde, for example, has given Friday Fridays off to staff who just need it for regenerative purposes. But of course, that only makes sense if the quantity of um, 
actual work actually changes. So you can sort of say, hey, you have Friday to take care of yourself, take care of your family, but is the is is the workload actually shifting to so that you actually have that Friday off? Um, I think that yes, there are we know that there are certain care and responsibilities that get more coverage and support than others. So one of the things at the beginning of the sort of lockdown, when you know everything happens too suddenly, there was no space to prepare. Uh, a lot of uh, mothers, young and older, just uh, had to wing it. And it was mainly mothers. So it wasn't that there weren't other parents uh, in the picture, but given um, existing gender hierarchies within society and our own institutions, a lot of the task fell uh, to mothers. Uh, and that became visible, even though we did not see the kind of res uh, response that we would expect, not from government and certainly not from our institutions. And this is something that is still being dealt with. But one of the things, at least speaking for myself personally, that we didn't really talk about was, as I mentioned earlier, this happened at around the same time uh, that a lot of Black people were traumatized by what had happened in the U.S. and uh, were able to, uh, some people were experiencing it here as well in, in the U.K. in terms of the relationship between uh, Black and uh, other communities of color's relationship with the police and the impact that that had and the sort of care that you had to undertake within the organization for our students of color. This was not necessarily acknowledged um, mainly because in a way it's always been there. It's just that, you know, in May of this past year, we who provided the care because we felt that we had to were also significantly traumatized. And I had to take time off a, from work at a time when my um, Canvas page was still due. And I, you know, my deadline did not change for that. So here I was on sick leave and I still had to uh, produce this work. Um, in any case, I mean, I think, one could argue that, you know, we just haven't really had time to process it. So perhaps in the future, this is something that we're really going to um, get a chance to uh, reflect on. Now, thinking through the, um, you know, the initiatives and responsibilities that universities have uh, and basically who, you know, who has a role to, to respond um, and, you know, what is the, what is the role of, um, of colleagues? Well, I must say, I'm not, I, I don't think I, I personally sort of have a strategy on, you know, how, how, how we go about this. Certainly, I believe that universities have a duty of care to their staff and they have a duty of care to their students uh, to make them ontologically secure. And how we understood this in the context of the um, article is that, you know, when you're, when you're, for example, providing support um, around, say, applying for funding applications, that you know, you don't either discursively or materially prioritize those people who you think are more likely to bring in the money because it's based on COVID, um, or um, people who are already in a, you know, people who, after this uh, crisis is over because they've been able to do their research, that they are not um, necessarily uh, advantaged over those people who were taking care of children, taking care of other people, and who were just effectively struggling uh, to, um, to cope during this crisis. The other thing that I think has been highlighted by uh, COVID, and I think, you know, we don't talk about it enough, that whereas I think, you know, with we're, I think, more or less clear about the gendered impact and we're coming to grips with the racialized impact. A lot of stuff that has been hard for a lot of us during COVID is the lived everyday experience of a lot of disabled people. And here we are, um, at least we make a showing of, you know, attending to some of the needs, uh, some of the caring needs or, or, or um, responding to some of the crisis needs of COVID where uh, disabled people have not been given the time of day for years and years. So at the very least, I would hope that in, a, in a, any sort of uh, reflection on regeneration and, and, and a, a recovery that is, um, 
that is beneficial to all and that is inclusive, that this comes front and, front and center, uh, that this isn't just, um, you know, these aren't just things that we do to recover from COVID, that it becomes part and parcel of our identity. What would those things look like? I mean, I think that the union has done a relatively good job in articulating how staff should be protected. So around the move to online teaching, we know how long that took to be enacted. Uh, in terms of colleagues, I think most people have been quite collegial and um, been quite supportive. Um, if there was, you know, the only thing I would say is that, and I'm not sure that this is can be material or tangible in any way, is that, you know, we don't make assumptions about what people are going, going through. So I think it's easy to do that when you're not seeing people every day or every week as you used to uh, in the hallways. Um, and that's where colleagues can be supportive. I think, you know, union can definitely be and there'll be a range of, uh, of ways in which you can do that uh, and on that note I should say if you're not in a union join a union thanks great thanks for that Tony those are some really interesting and important reflections and I just remember you know when when your piece your co-author piece first came out um it was, it just resonated, I guess, with what I was thinking. So this is where I'm like, great, we need to invite Tony to come and talk. But, you know, just your commentary here, I, I saw, I can only see Aggie on the video, but I saw her nodding along to a lot of these shared experiences um, across higher education. And I do like the idea of ontological um, insecurities and securities, as you say, that it offers more of a holistic look of who, the, the workers within higher education are um, and, and, the, and the different supports um, they, they require, right? To be secure workers. I guess I pushed you more on the precarity because as you know, I come from a feminist political economy background. So I was just wondering, I'm like, well, okay, what, what, what is new about this concept that feminist IP scholars haven't already, haven't already told us? Um, and then I, yeah, and then I, I'm particularly too, so as I'm totally abusing the position of chair until someone raises their hand or asks a comment <laughs> or uh, put something in the chat box, but um, yeah, I think that the care work, you're right, that this is feminists for a long time have been t telling us and demonstrating the, the care work that gets done, you know, in direct support of the university in terms of pastoral work and whatnot and the gendered implications of who actually does that work let alone you know the the uh, the um the other care work the broader care work of, of raising children of taking care of elderly of uh, you know broader reproductive um work as well and i mean my own personal reflections is i i am i agree with you that i feel like at king's too um everyone i think now needs to acknowledge care work more than what they used to, for sure. Um, but it just, yeah, it, it seems to be the the care work, the the parental care work, seems to be rendered much more visible than 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 other care work, which I also find curious and interesting. And then um, before I pass the floor over to Aggie for a question, um, just a yeah, a further reflection on. I think you raise a really important point about. You know, the universities were throwing money at research on COVID, but you're right and very, I think this is the experience at King's too, only certain framings of how that research gets conducted were done. And it's, I think, important to reflect upon what this re funded research will tell us if it's not embedded, like you said, in a framing of longer term that actually highlights that these structural inequalities, precarities, ontological insecurities, as you say, have a legacy, right? They just didn't start when COVID starts and they're not gonna end, you know? So um, so, so, what does that mean for the knowledge that we're, we are producing? Who's producing that knowledge and how we think about the implications of COVID? But I will stop with my commentary there um, and I will just um, pass the floor to Aggie for hopefully a question to you. Mine was more of commentary you can pick up or not as you want, Tony. Eggy? Great, thanks Amanda. And hi Tony, it's lovely to, to see you. Thank you for a brilliant talk as always. Um, you know, equal parts, you know, frustration and hope and rage and optimism and, and all of that stuff. And, and thank you to everybody who's doing all of the work that you're uh, setting out there, you know, extremely important. 
Um, I guess my question is about, you mentioned this concept of ontological security, and I was just wondering if you've engaged with the kind of critiques of the concept of ontological security that have come out. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Chris Rossdale's piece that came out, I think, four, year, four or five years ago now, probably. Um, and what he, uh, what I think it does is that it draws out this really important question of how do we navigate, on the one hand, needing certain kinds of security, right? Like on an everyday basis, we need to feel secure in our jobs, ourselves, our positions, our interactions. And yet, how do we simultaneously kind of maintain a critique of security projects, qua security projects, even at the level of ontology? Um, because as we know, security projects have at their heart this attempt to kind of totalize and, and master and always bring with them kind of hierarchies and exclusions of their own. So I guess I'm just wondering whether, um, whether you'd engage with those critiques of ontological security and, and how that bears out in your thinking. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Aggie. Um, Engaged, no, but I was just reading last night Chris's critique again because it came up for some um, another piece that I was um, working on, and I think I think that mm, so I think the critique stands. I wouldn't doubt that at all, especially uh, if I was uh, deploying this in a sort of the usual security con context. You would say, you know, one that somehow at some point one of the actors might be including the state. Um, I think in the context of this piece, we used it um, bearing in mind sort of the normative ba baggage linked to it, uh, that we used it as a descriptive uh, con concept for, I think, one main reason and to acknowledge one main thing that on the one hand what security means for me is still different to what it means for Catherine and it's still different to what it means uh, to um, Roberta but that that feeling of anxiety which again as I said earlier is not necessarily tangible like you know if you ask said you know I was sat on a therapist chair and they asked me you know tell me what you mean by what you feel like. I can't, I can't define it for you, but I know how I feel, you know, I, I know, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you make those comments on Twitter and people have similar comments, haven't read the same thing. It's not because they can see each other, but you know, it's sort of that reaction. And I think, you know, um, going back to the um, myths and definition that really resonated with us that, you know, it, it, it's, uh, and, and 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 to distinguish it from the point about precarity, where precarity is asking us to consistently reflect about um, those feelings of anxiety, but in relation to the structure, which is the case here. You know, it is uh, it is about the structure, but it's also about me as an academic outside of. University of Stirling specifically and just me out there in the world and the identity that I've cultivated for myself and how that's been impacted by COVID and, and, and those practices. And I think that's why we um, chose that as the descriptor, for example, rather than precarity, even though, as I said earlier, I actually think um, some more recent work around precarity is it's been quite useful. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I still think that that critique stands, and I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't discount that. And I, I would I would say you know there has to be care there. But I think that in the way that at least I understand it and and uh, it articulates those feelings of anxiety that are not quite tangible, but at the same time perhaps um, also help us make sense of our own reactions, uh, whether it's kind of a retreat or engagement with this uh, sort of crisis response, um, then makes it useful for us. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Um, Claudia put in the comments, so just a, a tag on for um, Aggie, or from Aggie's point is that um, she wonders how do we navigate the call for protection, ontological security with the other call of uh, transforming the university? Have you thought about how those work in relation to one another? Right, so, I mean, to, to my mind, I guess, you know, um, it might be appropriate that, you know, if you take this to its logical conclusion, you call for a sort of protection uh, on the part of the university. 
but I don't I wouldn't call for a protection in the part of the university. We are the university. If anything, this is a, a call to arms to reclaim what the university is. Um, at the same time, I guess, you know, one of the reasons why I'm often quite skeptical about a transforming the so mm, skeptical about transforming the university. I, I, I'm not skeptical about the idea that, you know, we can, uh, we should strive for change, whether it's through claims around, uh, you know, decolonizing the curriculum and all of that, and, you know, thinking those things through. But, but sometimes I think that conversation suggests that there will be an end point. Whereas the argument that I would make is that the university, in the way that it's constructed, to still, to keep claiming to be the university is quite hegemonic anyway. And so, um, you know, in however many years that university things have existed, people who look like me still don't belong. I don't think that that's going to change in 20 years, uh, even if we start talking more feminism. And, you know, it doesn't mean that I can't survive within the institution, but the institution is not built for me. And I, I cannot foresee a situation where the things that we say matter to the constitution of the university as it currently exists, even when we're looking at its best practice, will ever have space for people who look like me. But that doesn't mean that I I can't survive within it. And I think maybe that's where I don't think, you know, I don't think that the university can ever protect me. Um, although, of course, the university as a structure perhaps offers some sort of protection. I mean, at least I used to think it did, but given the conversations we're having about academic freedom and free speech, perhaps not so much. Yeah, I mean, that <laughs> such a dystopic view, which I think is so important too, isn't it? So it's, you know, I think it's where we look, like you said, to, to, um, being ontologically secure, right? And who, and, um, you know, uh, if it's not structure, if, if we don't believe that the university as a structure um, can ever fully, you know, um, be the space where um, people who, like, like you said, Tony, people who aren't white, who, you know, um, who the, the university itself, the architecture wasn't built on feel secure, then what, then who, then I guess, Maybe, maybe, maybe finding the solution isn't necessarily the answer at the moment. I'm not sure what the answer. Is. <laughs> no, I mean, I think so. I guess, I guess that's why I do come back to maybe the ontological security, at least as I would suggest we use it. Again, not perhaps not the logical conclusion of those people who do more theorizing than I do. That my ontological security within the university so me being ontologically secure within the university uh, is perhaps not just attached to what it is that the university does for me or to me right mm -hmm. and so actually in in uh the the you know the process of collaboration and uh engagement which is facilitated by the fact that you know the three of us are in university perhaps provides some sort of ontological uh, security, but that's not because Sterling or Newcastle or Bristol did anything for us. Uh, and I think maybe that would be the dis distinction that I would make there um, in terms of, you know, what you can expect or what you can't expect. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, at least I, I, you know, I'm hoping that's not what the what the article came across as that you know we should just sort of throw our hands up and and give up at this point. But actually, if we can call attention to the fact that um, the slippery slope that we think that we're on, uh, or you know, at different points in this particular crisis, you think you've reached the tip of the iceberg, that we need to be careful. Uh, that that's indeed not the case and that you know again like this week uh we kind of see the kind of conversations that are going on and that that are happening uh it really shows us that you know we are it's not just that we are in crisis mode but there are multiple crises that intersect and that covid is just um you know to use a very quantity term it's just an intervening variable in the broader crisis
I just wonder if there, I know there are some particular ECRs that are um, and PhD students that are on this um, or in this meeting too, and I'm not sure if they have particular reflections. I know, um, you know, um, Tony, you and I have both read that recent kind of um, uh, multiple oh. I wonder if you can, and that particularly, it you know addresses or confronts ESRC in the broader funding of PhD students too, and the funding infrastructures, let alone like we have REF and all of that still going ahead. Like, what um, I, I just wonder if you could offer some thoughts upon you know reading that, particularly for PhD students. Yeah. So um, I uh, thank you again for sending that to me. And I think it kind of captures a lot of the other the conversations that have been going on in different spaces, particularly on social media around um, how uh, Ukraine in particular has uh, behaved. I think, you know, there are a few things that it highlights for me. And, and again, this is where you sort of see, OK, we're, we're in this crisis and COVID is just one thing. Well, the first is number one, like, you know, the, the percentage of uh, PhD students who actually get funding from Ukraine in this country is quite small. Uh, however, uh, Ukraine, or in, in our case, usually it's the ESRC, right? Um, the guidelines that they set for how the PhDs run is the one that most uh, institutions take on. So what happens in the Ukraine? cosmos uh, tends to affect all PhD students, uh, regardless of who is funding you. I think the possible exception of that is, is perhaps students that are funded by a welcome trust. They seem to be happier on the whole. <laughs> um, so a few things. One, Yukri's, um reaction has been abysmal. Uh, but Yukri's reaction is not out of step with most institutions, including mine, and this idea of resilience. Now, resilience, at least as I understand it, in of itself, I mean, if you're just looking at a dictionary definition, it's, it's not actually a bad thing. But it, in my experience, it's often um, attached to certain ideological frames uh, within our higher education sector that I've actually found to be quite destructive, um, where, you know, basically if you're, if things are not going well for you, it's kind of your fault. Um, whereas, I mean, I think that's slightly different from, you know, um, yeah, we need to adapt to, to crisis and how do we adapt to crisis so that, you know, we can bounce back better. Nothing that Ukraine has done, in my opinion, would suggest that you know this is the perspective they want to take, even though the language has been very much, yeah, you know, you should you should just really, it's up to you guys to devise, up to your supervisor. So more labor on those people who have supervision. Um, um, but also the anxiety, the levels of anxiety that this has created amongst a PhD students. So I know someone who's um, their research is supposed to be in South Africa and they can't. They can't go, they physically cannot go to South Africa, not the least because, it, you know, first it's outside of the UK, but secondly, you know, there's the whole South African variant thing. So I think, you know, that was the double whammy. And yet they've had to fill out like paper, uh, you know, pages and pages of and pages of paperwork around mitigation and sort of, you know, changing the project because that's not the project that you pre wanted to fund. And there's been absolutely no care at all around, you know, this is just physically undoable. It's not because I don't want to do it, but this is physically undoable. There's been no reflection around that. Meanwhile, what is the institution doing? It's like, well, there's just this paperwork to fill, so good luck with that. So on the whole, right, um, this has been a big problem, but I also see it as part of a bigger problem, like, you know, bigger problem that's often always affected early career researchers from PhD to postdoc. Part of a bigger problem wherein for even the sort of diversion of monies to um, studying COVID has not seen COVID funding for the communities most affected by COVID in this country. You know, the fact that, you know, no, no black scholar got any funding despite the applications that have gone through a lot of the same processes. 
So again, I sort of see this as being on a continuum. Uh, was it surprising? Absolutely not. I think I think that's the only thing I would say I was, well, it's not the only thing. Uh, the only thing I was sad about, everything else I was very angry about. The thing that I was sad about is that some people were actually surprised. And it's like, mm, if you ask those people who couldn't even get funding because, you know, historically, UCRE, ESRC, AHRC, MRC, doesn't provide a lot of funding for people of color in this country, then um, it's not surprising that, you know, this is the attitude that they would take, uh, this attitude of disdain to um, people who have in good faith applied for funding, who have in good faith, you know, been doing their work, and people who might, you know, also be parents or have other care and responsibilities and just, uh, because it's not even a pretense that they don't exist. It's an acknowledgement that they exist, but that, you know, they're not our problem. Um, and, you know, I think reports like the one that you shared are, useful to bring together those experiences and to create a space and a forum for a bit of uh, reflection. But given the sort of um, my dialogue and engagement with activists who've been on Ukri's case around inequalities, I mean, I'm not convinced that anything is going to change. Yeah. I think there was a question from Laura. So Laura, you already asked answered it while she was typing it. It was uh -huh. more of okay. a, yeah. Does, does the broader call of decolonizing fix anything? <laughs> You're like, nope. In short, um, yeah. So, but but Aggie had a question that she wanted to ask. Okay. Sorry to jump in again. If uh, if anyone else wants to go ahead, please do. But um, I was just I was wondering about your own experience, Tony, and, and those of your co-authors, and indeed other folks in, in, on the call as well. How do you sort of navigate the tension between, on the one hand, it's very hard to do any of this work when you have unsympathetic institutions or unsympathetic management at departmental or school level or whatever. But on the other hand, if you do have sympathetic or seemingly sympathetic folks, um, you know, there is that danger or that possibility then that, um, that they both want to get involved and then and then oversee and then somehow kind of take ownership of but they're at the same moment potentially dilute and divert some of these activities so i mean how do you see the relationship between the kind of grassroots people trying to do this work on a kind of semi-formal basis i.e yeah. <laughs> all of us um yeah. and those folks who kind of um on the one hand would want to seem to facilitate it but on the other hand you know then <laughs> box checking exercises and, and mainstreaming activities get, in, get involved. Like, how should that dynamic work in your experience? Because I'm, I'm finding myself a bit stymied by that at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would say I, I'm probably just perhaps as frustrated as you. Um, I'll give you one example. So a few, I think it was just last week. I mean, the days blend into each other now. I don't know what day it is, but I think it was last week. And I was, uh, every Wednesday we get sent a sort of communication round from the university. And for me, a way to be part of the university community still, particularly when everything is online, is to go through that. You know, sometimes they announce who's gotten new funding and you can say congratulations or, you know, some new exercise class that, you know, I never remember to go to somehow. But, you know, I go through those, uh, the Wednesday communications and one of it was around decolonizing the curriculum. And I thought, well, you know, um, University of Edinburgh has been really good around this um, and still has Glasgow sort of uh, reflecting on the links to slavery and colonialism. So I thought, OK, you know, what is my institution wanting to do about this? And I clicked on the link and it took me to a page of, you know, uh, not to put anybody on blast, two white women on a page where decolonizing the curriculum was embedded within this logic of resilience that I was talking about, right? So again, to be clear, I'm not, you know, I've done some research and reading around resilience myself. I don't think that you cannot not use it, particularly in our, uh, in our line of work, but I've seen how it's been articulated in the context of higher education since COVID, which is what I'm skeptical about. And the fact that it was sort of, embedded within resilience, not decolonizing curriculum for its own sake, 
whatever you, you know, before we even get to how they understand that, but being embedded within sort of this resilience. Um, and I had a very visceral reaction to it because I sort of tweeted about them. So many people were shocked. And I'm like, I mean, I don't even know if I'm shocked or angry or anything. And my reaction was, you know, this is why I uh, disengage with certain processes. So when you ask, you know, how does that dynamic work? Olivia Ritizibwa has this um, a concept of ethical retreat. And I, I sort of turned that on his head. So like, you know, when she's talking about ethical retreat, she's basically talking about people who have power uh, leave in a particular space because it causes more harm than good. And, you know, in this context states, but I sort of turned that on his head and I sort of think of it as um, me uh, leaving a space because what is actually happening, I think is unethical. So it's ethical for me to actually withdraw from that space, even though I don't, it's not that I have power in that particular space. I just find it as a useful descriptor. Uh, and so sometimes I think you have to make that call um, because, uh, in, in, you know, I, I think, you know, sometimes it's it's good to be in certain spaces where you can properly raise your voice and, you know, put your foot down about certain things. But I, you know, in this particular context where in the midst of, uh, you know, pandemic, people literally dying, you choose that moment to decide that, you know, of all the moments before, and possible moments after you want to decolonize the curriculum within a narrative of resilience and adaptability. I can't, there is no way that I can trust you even if you say you're sorry, because that was the deliberate choice. So I think that in some cases, you know, eh, you just have to say, yeah, I'm not doing that. Eh, in other cases, when you have allies, when you have enough people around the table who are saying, really uh you know it's useful to bind together and uh, that you know the result of that is this article the result of that is the article we've submitted to you um but in other in other contexts you just have to say no thanks so like earlier this year i was asked i wasn't asked to be fair because my head of department is awesome she said so you know this stuff around uh black history month is going on in october i'm just you know letting you know out there I was like, no, because this was the university that released this Black Lives Matter statement on a Saturday and on Facebook. I find, you know, it's 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 very hard for me to believe that you you do care. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm not going to be used um, to pretend that you care about those things. Like you know, right now we're trying to get to figure out. Um, how to support students who might have to quarantine for almost 2,000 pounds and you know who's going to put up that money. So do you care about black lives or do you just care about their money? So things like that sometimes means that I, I, I just don't engage and I think that's okay. Some people would ascribe it to a self-care issue and I think in some cases it is, but I think in other cases, I think it's just ethical to do that. I mean, again, not to bring in my own research again, Tony, I feel like I want to go off. should. <laughs> I feel what, you know, for, um, and I, I'm sure Claudia and Aggie will be, you know, nodding along because I've talked at ad nauseum to them about this too, it's the concept of affect too, right? Um, and, and how, I mean, what you're describing and trying to articulate the the indescribable, the intangibles, right? I think also speak to the concept of affect as well as in terms of, you know, what Berlant and Ahmed, for example, describes it too, mm -hmm. um, and how that becomes gendered, racialized, classed in how people experience are expected to absorb more than others, right? Um, swallow more than others who can have outbursts, who can swallow, who can, and I think all of this also ties into the concept of resilience, right? Who gets rendered more resilient, who gets rendered more ontologically secure is, is um, those aspects too. So maybe over a glass of wine at some point, we can um, hammer out what we think might be another journal article around this too. So thinking about this and sharing, and I do like, uh, yeah, your your point of, of knowing when to just disengage and, and say no, because I think we all get frustrated with the broader social justice, EDI kind of campaigns like Aggie articulated quite well you know, it's the constant um, push, push, um, and then deciding when to pursue something and when not, I think that's, that's pretty good wisdom as well, too. 
Um, but I've talked way too much. Does anyone else have um, any other closing remarks? I think you just speak so eloquently, Tony, that um, I, I don't know. I prefer just listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind. <laughs> But I don't know if anyone would just leave the space a pause, you know, virtually you always have to pause a bit more um, to see if anyone else has any kind of final comments or commentaries. Again, I love that the, you know, some PhD and ECR students are here. And I know anecdotally through these different shared spaces, we've been able to, I mean, uh, Egg and I and, and, and Claudia participate quite frequently in the writing or re, um, writing sprints. And this has, um, I think offers another great space where you can collectively um, share ideas, feelings, thoughts, like you said, you know, about the university, there's the structures of the university, but then there's also the colleagues, right, the networks, the friendships and whatnot that I think are so important. And this is able to foster spaces of multiple perspectives and experiences, which I think is really important. And we still need to hold, hold on to that, too. Yeah. And, yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone's going to raise their hands. I think they're just, yeah, it's, and it's totally fine. It's great that, you know, people are in the room listening and we're, we're engaging in these conversations. So Tony, I guess I'll just give the, the floor left over to you or any kind of final reflections or thoughts before we close this cafe. <laughs> great. Um, I mean, I guess one of the things that I, I've been thinking about lately is, you know, often we say things like you know the structure and I say that as well like the university and in the end right um we do that because we want to distinguish um those things that seem unchanging and harmful to us from the things that uh make us feel good help us become our best selves uh, which are, you know, the friendships, the different types of collaborations and that happen across institutions. But I also want, but I, you know, increasingly I'm thinking sometimes that gives a pass to what is in effect people. That, you know, if you say, um, yeah, so, you know, whatever it is that we say that is wrong with our universities, this is based on decisions that specific people are making, either as a group because they are in particular positions or as individuals, but also because they're in particular positions. And this group collectively known as the management, uh, but often refer to themselves as uh, leadership. And I guess uh, that's where my, a lot of my thoughts and, and my conversations with uh, both Roberta and, and Catherine is sort of tending to these days in, in, you know, as sort of an extension of, of, of what we're talking about in the article about, you know, the distinctions between management um, and leadership and the importance of still recognizing agents within structure and agents that have uh the power to change uh, and that change obviously can be um, again regenerative or toxic as we find so you know definitely do not let vcs off the hook even if it's it feels more productive to just disengage for a while but you know there's a reason why they are the ceos of the institutions and that's why you know i'll be frank and say i'm quite pleased by a uh, what's not what led to it, but the kind of responses in uh, both Leicester and in Manchester around choices that have been made uh, in the context of COVID for whatever reason. And that, you know, when, when you feel bugged down by the system, uh, I think that's a, that it's a productive way for us to sort of, you know, make sense of the world around us, but, you know, when you do have that energy again, don't forget that this system is being driven by certain people, by a certain person, and for particular reasons and interests. And, you know, we should be able to hold those accountable, those people accountable. Thank you so much for your reflections and thank you for ending it on a both. It's okay to retreat, have self-care, but, you know, 
let's build ourselves up as a community and fight back. And you're right in, in naming people behind these processes and structures and institutions, right? So to concretely name that these are people and these are concrete social relations that are underpinning why decisions are being made. So um, yeah, again, Tony, thank you so much for co-authoring this amazing piece and the research that you continue to do on this work. It's so important. Um, and thanks so much for your activism around this we need this across university spaces too right so um and and for giving us a very sobering reminder of reality but also spaces again my turning to affect spaces of hope right yeah. <laughs> that, that you know that always exists so thank you for presenting at our edi cafe chat and thank you very much for having me <laughs> All right. And hopefully, you know, this isn't the last of our continual conversations on this. So Absolutely. thanks everyone for attending too. And uh, we'll hopefully see you next Wednesday. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, thank